and welcome to what I call the criminality panel. Uh, we are somewhat organized uh, and acting in concert, so I guess that's in keeping with uh, Section 37 of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. And we will, in fact, this, this panel will be discussing Sections 36 and 37 of IRPA, breaking it down, analyzing the, the authorities that have uh, uh, recently uh, dealt with the uh, those, those provisions. Um, they have certainly spawned a, a lot of argument in, in my court, the federal court. I'm, I'm a judge of the federal court here in Ottawa uh, and, and elsewhere uh, and have given rise to a considerable amount of uh, jurisprudence. Uh, the sample that we see in the federal court is undoubtedly skewed in, in the sense that we usually see only uh, the cases where applicants have run afoul of the criminal admissibility rules, and we, we rarely, if ever, see cases involving individuals who have somehow avoided uh, th those provisions. So this, this panel will be looking at the statutory language and its application in, in the field. We have a very distinguished and knowledgeable group this morning, um, and I'm going to try and stay mostly out of their way. Each of them will present for about 15 minutes. My thinking is that perhaps we can leave the questions to the end, so we'll have a half an hour or so at the end to, uh, to, to field questions, and, uh, and the panel will do their best to answer them. Um, I'm also going to try to stay out of the way because in return they have promised to be kind to me in respect of some of the decisions I've written in, in this area. Um, so we're, uh, contrary to the rule book that I received, weren't supposed to do introductions, but I'm going to anyway, uh, because uh, the bio biographies of these panelists have not been included in the official uh, uh, biographical sketches that, you, uh, that, that you've received as part of the program. So we're going to start with um, Professor Gregory Israelstam. Uh, professor Israelstam is currently an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law, as well as a candidate in the Master's of Law program at the University of Ottawa. Greg teaches in the Legal Studies program at Algonquin, uh, and he was called to the bar in 1996 and served as an Immigration Foreign Service Officer from 1996 to 2000. Greg was counsel at Canada's Department of Justice between 2001 and 2015. After that, we have uh, Olive Sonnenschein. Olive is counsel at the Department of Justice and has been working as a lawyer in the Legal Services Unit for CBSA since 2007. She holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from McGill University and a Common Law degree from the University of Ottawa. During law school, Olive worked at the Department of Justice's War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity section, as well as what was then known as the Federal Prosecution Service. Uh, she spent a year clerking at the federal court, so she got a good grounding in, in this area. She was then called to the bar and started working at a policy unit in the Department of Justice. In her, uh, she tells me that in her role as decision maker of a busy family, she provides appropriate, an appropriate degree of procedural fairness to her husband and three children, depending on the context. And I asked her whether her decisions were reviewable on a correctness standard, and she said they, were, they weren't reviewable at all. So that's a privative clause that I wouldn't mind seeing. Next, we have uh, Marco Catani. Uh, Marco has a BA degree from Concordia and a law degree from the University of Montreal. Uh, he was a sole practitioner in Montreal for approximately four years with a main area of practice in immigration and refugee law. In 2002, he joined the Montreal Office of the Immigration and Refugee Board. Since then, uh, he worked as a hearings officer at the Refugee Protection Division, was a member of the Immigration Division, as well as a member of the Immigration Appeal Division currently holds the position of legal advisor with legal services responsible for providing a full range of legal advice to IRB management, decision makers, and staff. And finally, we have um, Andrew Brower. Andrew is Legal Aid Ontario's Senior Counsel in Refugee Law. In this capacity, he leads the organization's law reform and test case strategy to improve access to justice in the area of refugee and immigration law. Uh, he is recognized by the Law Society of Upper Canada as a certified specialist in refugee and immigration law. He appears before all levels of court and tribunals 
including all divisions of the Immigration Refugee Board, the Federal Court, Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court of Canada. He was most recently before the Supreme Court of Canada in 2015, representing an intervener in the uh, famous B-010 decision uh, or case and um, the Apollo Napa appeals on the issue of immigration inadmissibility, people smuggling, smuggling and refugee law. Um, he also represents clients before the United Nations Committee Against Torture and the UN uh, Human Rights Committee. Uh, he serves as Vice President of the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers, a voluntary association of refugee lawyers, academics, and students dedicated to defending and promoting human rights of refugees and other forcibly displaced migrants. So an excellent panel. I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion. And uh, so we'll start with, uh, with Greg. So I don't know, um, because this is an academic conference and not a legal conference, I'm not sure how familiar people are with the provisions in the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act about serious criminality. I'll talk a, a little bit about them in case you're not familiar. And I'll talk about them very specifically uh, in the context of one problem that occurs over and over again in immigration practice. Um, you can be inadmissible for serious criminality if you have been convicted in Canada of an offense for which a penalty of 10 years can be imposed or for which a penalty of six months or more has been imposed. And being inadmissible for serious criminality has two effects. One can prevent an application from being accepted. So if you're applying for permanent residence to Canada, you're going to be refused if you are found to be seriously inadmiss or inadmissible for serious criminality. But perhaps more dramatically, if you are a permanent resident in Canada, you can be refused or you can be removed if you are found to be seriously inadmissible for serious criminality. So what that means is that if you are a permanent resident, and you are convicted, and you are sentenced to a term of imprisonment of greater than six months, or you're sentenced uh, for an offense, you're convicted of, of an offense for which a 10-year penalty could have been imposed, that could mean you're going to be removed. And this is problematic for permanent residents for a couple of reasons. One of them is that a lot of permanent residents don't know that they're permanent residents. Uh, imagine that you come to Canada as a child and you're given permanent resident status. And for whatever reason, your parents never bother applying for citizenship on your behalf. You may grow up assuming that you're a citizen of Canada. You may never know what your status is. And as an adult, you end up getting involved in criminality. You end up getting convicted of an offense. And suddenly, after the conviction, somebody from the Canada Border Services Agency contacts you and says, we're going to begin removal proceedings against you because you're inadmissible for serious criminality. So we're going to talk a little bit about that particular problem. And originally I was going to talk about a case that the Supreme Court uh, recently decided called Tran. And I reread Tran uh, before I started making notes for my presentation, and I realized there wasn't a whole lot to talk about in Tran. Tran basically clarified a few important points, but it doesn't really give us a lot of legal principles. Um, I'll go through Tran very quickly. Mr. Tran uh, was a long term permanent resident in Canada, and Mr. Tran was in exactly that situation. He had been in Canada for years and years and years. Um, he ended up, uh, without ever applying for citizenship, he ended up uh, getting convicted of a criminal offense. In this case, he was convicted of um, producing a controlled substance. Uh, he basically was running a grow up. Um, and he was sentenced to a conditional sentence of 12 months. And after he was convicted, CBSA contacted him and said, well, this makes you inadmissible for serious criminality. 
because you've been convicted and you've been sentenced to more than six months. And in addition, because the maximum penalty for your offense has changed since you committed it, and it's now 12 years, it was seven years at the time that he committed it, you're also inadmissible because you've been sentenced to a term of imprisonment you've been convicted of a crime for which you could be sentenced to 10 years or more. And Mr. Tran said, well, hang on a second. First of all, at the time I committed the offense, the maximum penalty was seven years, not 10 years. And I was sentenced to a 12-month conditional sentence. I didn't actually have to serve any time in prison. And this went up to the Supreme Court. And ultimately, the Supreme Court agreed with Mr. Tran on both of these points. They said that for the purposes of calculating the maximum sentence, you look at the sentence at the time of the commission of the offense, not at the time of the sentence or the conviction, and not at the time of the determination of admissibility. Second of all, they said that a conditional sentence doesn't count as a term of imprisonment. So Mr. Tran was not sentenced to a term of imprisonment of greater than six months. The conditional sentence is served in the community, and it's not really served. He just has to abide by certain conditions. And that's pretty well all that Tran does. And Tran is useful and very helpful because it clarifies a bunch of important points. And uh, certainly, I know that in some respects, CBSA is kind of grateful for this uh, because it means that if... Uh, it needs to, it can remove somebody who's serving a conditional sentence because normally CBSA won't remove somebody until they finish their sentence. But it does highlight the problem of what happens when a long-term permanent resident does something that renders them criminally inadmissible and they don't know that there are immigration consequences to the conviction. One of the things that happens in the criminal justice system in Canada is that a substantial number of people who are charged with, a, with an offense end up pleading guilty. We have a very busy criminal justice system. Um, there's a lot of incentive for people to plead to a lesser sentence and to agree or plead to a lesser offense and agree to a sentence that is lower than they might get if they ended up going to trial. So a lot of people who are charged end up pleading guilty. And if you're a permanent resident who doesn't know that there are immigration consequences, this means that you could agree to plead guilty, get a sentence, and then discover that this renders you inadmissible for serious criminality and makes you subject to removal. Do people who are in that situation get a chance to go back and argue, wait, I didn't know what the consequences of my guilty plea are, I should be allowed to rescind it. I apologize. I am terrible with PowerPoint presentations. I was told that I have to do a PowerPoint presentation. My typical pattern when I'm doing this is to talk, forget that I've got a PowerPoint presentation behind me, and then click through all of them at the end. So I apologize in advance. So. This was the situation in a case that was recently argued before the Supreme Court in, called Wong. And Mr. Wong, like Mr. Tran, was a long-term permanent resident, never took out citizenship, and he ended up getting involved in drug trafficking and was convicted of trafficking cocaine. And Mr. Wong was ultimately sentenced uh, to nine months in jail. And this makes him inadmissible for serious criminality. More than six months actual sentence. Once he found out that this made him inadmissible for serious criminality and made him subject to removal, he argued that he should be allowed to rescind his plea of guilty on the grounds that he did not understand the nature and consequences of the guilty plea. And that's one of the conditions for the acceptance of a guilty plea in the criminal code, that the accused has to satisfy the court that they understand the nature and consequences of the plea. So he argued that there were immigration consequences that he wasn't aware of, and therefore he should be allowed to take back his guilty plea. So the question before the court in Wong is basically, 
whether or not failure to understand the immigration consequences of a guilty plea is enough to let you take that guilty plea back. And this worked its way through the courts. Uh, the last decision we have on it is from the British Columbia Court of Appeal, which held that in Mr. Wong's case, no, it was not enough. The fact that he did not understand the immigration consequences is not in and of itself enough to allow him to take his plea back. Now, the United States has dealt with this uh, in a case called Padilla versus Kentucky. And they've taken a fairly liberal position on this. They basically say that um, if an accused doesn't understand that there are immigration consequences, that may well be enough to allow them to take their plea back. Um, and they've framed it as a competence of counsel issue. They have said that there's a positive duty on criminal defense lawyers to actually explain to their clients that a conviction may mean that there are going to be immigration consequences. They don't have to be experts in it. They don't have to explain what these consequences are. But at the very least, they have to say, look, a conviction may mean that you're going to get deported. You should at least speak to an immigration lawyer. Courts in Canada haven't used that kind of framework. And courts in Canada have tended to be um, all over the map with this question. There are some courts that have uh, ruled that not understanding the nature of co and consequences, getting to that threshold is fairly easy. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case uh, called Tai Fair, um, 2003, and it basically said in the context of an accused not having been given uh, disclosure properly, um, and then the accused pleads guilty, the fact that they weren't given disclosure meant that they didn't quite understand the nature and consequences of the act. They didn't know enough to make an informed guilty plea. And that really was the extent of the analysis in TIFER. So TIFER basically stands for the proposition that if you make a guilty plea without knowing all of the facts around it, that's enough. You don't know the nature and consequences. You can take that guilty plea back later. And the Ontario Court of Appeal, in a case called Quick, uh, from 2016, basically followed that. And they said that provided that the information that the accused didn't have was of substantial import to the accused, that was enough to render the accused unable to comprehend the nature and consequences of the plea and would allow the accused to take the plea back. And the actual language that the court used in Quick uh, was that did the consequences or information that the accused not have, would that have mattered to the accused? And if the answer is yes, the information or the consequences are significant, and that would basically allow the accused to rescind their plea. Other courts haven't followed that line of reasoning. And in fact, the British Columbia Court of Appeal didn't follow that line of reasoning. They, uh, the majority, um, held that lack of knowledge of immigration consequences, um, for it to matter enough for the accused to rescind their plea, it would have to have changed the accused's behavior. In other words, the accused would have had to have shown that they would have pled differently had they known the immigration consequences of the appeal. And in that case, they found that the accused hadn't demonstrated that, so the accused couldn't rely on not knowing the nature and consequences of the plea and wasn't allowed to change it. The minority in the British Columbia Court of Appeal actually took an even stricter position, and they said not only does uh, the accused have to show that they might have pled differently, they have to show that it would have made a difference in the ultimate verdict. In other words, the accused has to show that they have a path to acquittal. That was the term they used. And if the accused doesn't have a path to acquittal, then it doesn't matter if they didn't know the immigration consequences because it wouldn't have mattered to the accused in the long run. The Wong case ended up being a pretty big one. 
both the British Columbia uh, Attorney General and Mr. Wong were parties, but there were also, I believe, uh, 11 interveners in total, uh, refugee law groups, uh, other pro uh, provincial attorney generals, uh, the uh, criminal lawyer associations, and so on, each arguing sometimes very, very different points. Some of them argued that any consequences that an accused doesn't know is enough to trigger uh, a finding that they didn't know the nature and consequences of the act. Uh, one of the interveners suggested that these consequences don't even have to be legal consequences. They might potentially be familial consequences. Um, Justice Wagner, I don't think, had a lot of patience for that uh, during the hearing uh, and asked, well, what if you're convicted of sexual assault and your family abandons you as a result of the conviction. Is that a consequence that somebody should have told you about? And if they didn't, does that give you the right to take your plea away? Um, the British Columbia Attorney General argued that the only consequences that actually matter are the penal consequences. As long as an accused knows that they're pleading guilty to a particular offense and knows that there are going to be penal consequences, that in and of itself is enough, or it means that they knew the nature and consequences of the act. That's my time, Justice Barnes. So the actual hearing before the Supreme Court was uh, at the end of last year. We we're still waiting for the Supreme Court to rule. Um, I don't really have a prediction. I think that they're going to take an intermediate uh, position. But I do think that um, it is going to clarify. I think for anyone who is an immigration practitioner, this is really common. You're constantly seeing this in the press that uh, a long-term permanent resident uh, does something that renders them criminally inadmissible um, and they're subject to removal. After having lived in Canada all their life, they're going to be removed to a country that they don't know. Perhaps they don't speak the language anymore. Um, as an immigration practitioner, um, I'm sure Mr. Brower has seen this situation over and over again. So Wong is going to be, I think, a very, very important case because what typically happens for immigration practitioners is that this only comes to them once the person's actually been convicted. This doesn't come to them before, and they may, their criminal lawyer may simply not be aware that there are immigration consequences. The accused may not know that there are immigration consequences because the accused may believe that they're a citizen and simply think that they'll serve their sentence and be let out, and that'll be the end of it. So, I told you I would be doing this. So stay tuned. We're going to get a decision sometime in the next few months, and I think this is going to have a fairly dramatic impact uh, on immigration law and inadmissibility for serious criminality in Canada. That's all I have to say. Thanks for your attention. Um, are we going to take questions at the end or at the end? At the end? Great. Thanks very much. So I'm going to talk to you about a different provision of the IRPA. It's an inadmissibility provision dealing with organized crime. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so it's 37.1b of the IRPA. Um, so in order for an individual to be found inadmissible for 37.1b, the person has to be a permanent resident or a foreign national. Uh, they must engage in activities such as people smuggling, trafficking in persons, or laundering of money or other proceeds of crime. Note that this is a non-exhaustive list since the list uh, of activities are given as examples. And this was actually the subject of a federal court decision in a case called Dillon. The federal court found that drug smuggling is a transnational crime that is included in 37.1b even though it's not explicitly listed there. The presentation uh, is going to focus on people smuggling since it forms the bulk of the jurisprudence that we have. Um, so the difference between people smuggling applies to cases where the person being smuggled agrees to procure his or her illegal entry into a state, whereas human trafficking involves threats or use of force, abduction, deception, or other forms of coercion 
against the trafficked persons. It often exploits men, women, or children for purposes of forced labor or commercial sexual exploitation. So as you can see, the lines between trafficking and smuggling uh, can be blurred, and it's very possible that a crime may begin as human smuggling and then very quickly turn into a case of human trafficking. This photo is uh, the Ocean Lady vessel, which departed from Thailand, took a six-week voyage before arriving in Canada in October 2009. The passengers aboard were all Tamil men from Sri Lanka of military age between the ages of 17 and 45 years old. Ten months later, the MV Sunsea arrived in Canada with 492 people on board comprised of men and women of all ages and children. This vessel was at sea for three months before it arrived in Canada. One person died during the journey. So before I get started on, on telling you about the law, I want you to keep in the back of your mind some uh, elements that might leave you with questions about this particular uh, vessel. So the individuals aboard claim that the entire criminal organization just abandoned the vessel while the vessel was at sea somehow they just spirited out of there and that the passengers decided to make the, the voyage anyway so the passengers figured out how to navigate a vessel with 492 passengers aboard undetected the entire way to bc and that they were able to ration food and the necessary uh, supplies to make it so that's element number one uh, element number two was discussed in a federal court case called b261 where the federal court described a situation where the applicant tried to both minimize and emphasize the seriousness of his wounds, ostensibly to suit his own immigration purposes. So the applicant had testified that any scarring he may have is small and, is small and caused by playing soccer on the stones. Whereas CBSA examining officers described the scars on his back as slash marks, that appeared to indicate that the applicant had suffered deep gouges or fighting wounds, and also noted that there were circular marks on one of his legs which looked like bullet wounds or shrapnel wounds. So these are individuals who were saying, no, I, I was not a member of the LTTE, I never participated in any war, yet they had wounds that were consistent with someone who was fighting. Um, Okay, so we'll get to the Supreme Court decision in B10. Uh, the Supreme Court decision in B10 is based on five cases that were collectively heard. Uh, the case of Hernandez is a Cuban national who was accepted as a refugee in the US. He was then convicted in the US of human smuggling and he was issued a deportation order. He came to Canada and claimed refugee status. The other four, uh, B10, JP, GJ, and B306. So these were all done in order to anonymize these individuals so that we wouldn't be creating a refugee surplus situation by identifying them. So these individuals uh, all came on the Sutton Sea. And uh, the organizers of the vessel that we saw before with the very poor conditions were charging individuals between twenty and $30,000 uh, to arrive in Canada to take that voyage. In another case, there was testimony that, that someone had paid up to $60,000 to make the voyage. Uh, so B10 worked in the engine room. JP said that his duties were to stand lookout, read GPS and radar, uh, and he acted as an assistant navigator during the voyage. In return, he and his wife, JG, GJ lived in crew quarters and benefited from more humane conditions than most of the migrants. B306 acted as a cook and a lookout, and he claimed he did it in order to receive better rations because he was hungry and in poor health. So all of these individuals were found inadmissible to Canada under 371B of the ERPA on the grounds that they had engaged in people smuggling. The Supreme Court held that the appeal should be allowed and the case is remitted back to the IRB for a new hearing in accordance with the reasons that I will now discuss. 
So the Supreme Court in B-10 confirms that an individual is inadmissible for people smuggling under 37.1b if, first of all, the foreign national or the permanent resident acts to procure or further the illegal entry of asylum seekers. Procuring uh, should be interpreted broadly and could include facilitating, enabling, causing, inducing, organizing, or persuading people to cross borders without complying with the necessary requirements for legal entry. The second requirement that the Supreme Court found, and this is a, a new requirement or a new development, is that of financial benefit, financial or material benefit. So the financial benefit part could be straightforward enough and could include currency, stocks, and bonds. But we're left with the question of what material benefit could be, and that might be a more difficult question to define. We know that it does not include either safety or family reunification from the Supreme Court decision, but query whether it could include being given free items, free passage on a smuggling vessel, or only having to pay a reduced fare. Um, and it can include non-pecuniary motives such as terrorism or sexual exploitation. Uh, the third element is also new. So the provision itself only states transnational crime, and the Supreme Court has read in transnational organized crime. So insofar as people smuggling is concerned, we look to the criminal code definition of organized crime, which includes a material including financial benefit. And that's really what the Supreme Court focused on, that there needs to be a financial um, or material benefit. Okay, so what isn't included in the 37 inadmissibility? So the Supreme Court found that there were two types of activities that would not capture an individual for people smuggling. The first one is if the individual was giving humanitarian aid, and the second one was said to be mutual assistance among asylum seekers in the course of their collective flight to safety, including assistance to family members. So we can tell from reading the Supreme Court decision in B-10 that they were clearly concerned about not denying access to Canada's refugee determination process pursuant to Canada's obligations under the Refugee Convention. However, the Supreme Court went a step further and exempted from inadmissibility individuals who were not themselves part of the smuggling venture, but who are who were described as humanitarians or family members and who nonetheless uh, assist individuals in the illegal entry to Canada. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of cases uh, that have come to the federal court after the Supreme Court decision in B-10. So this is how the courts are, are applying the Supreme Court reasons in B-10. So the first one is a case called uh, Akula Napar. Uh, he arrived in Canada on the Ocean Lady vessel. He left Sri Lanka and applied for refugee status in Thailand. So he was living in Thailand for quite a while. A few months prior to boarding the Ocean Lady to come to Canada, he was notified that he was eligible for third country resettlement by the UNHCR. He thought that the resettlement would take too long. Therefore, he agreed to pay a smuggler $35,000 to be smuggled to Canada aboard the Ocean Lady. He agreed to work as a crew member in exchange for a $5,000 discount. The IRB found that Mr. Apulinapar was not a member of the criminal organization and that the profits accrued to the smugglers and not to him himself. However, the IRB found Mr. Apulinapar knowingly and voluntarily joined the crew and significantly aided the smugglers. The IRB found that the reduction in fee charged for Mr. Apulinapar to travel to Canada qualified as a financial or material benefit. So the Immigration and Refugee Board concluded Mr. Apulinapar acted in knowing furtherance of the aims of the criminal organization, even if he was not himself a member of the organization, and that rendered him inadmissible. Um, I think part of what was the, the linchpin here is that there was no evidence that Mr. Apulinapar was at risk in Thailand, or there, nor was there a prospect of removal to Sri Lanka. Therefore, Mr. Apulinapar was not fleeing safety and could not be considered to have been merely aiding 
in the illegal entry of other refugees or asylum seekers in the course of their collective flight to safety. So the federal court upheld the IRB's decision and found that it complied with uh, the Supreme Court decision in B-10 and was reasonable. Uh, on the other hand, Handa Sami uh, was another ocean lady case, and this one ended up going the other way. So Mr. Handasamy left Sri Lanka for Malaysia in January 2007, and he stayed there for over two years. He heard there was a vessel traveling to Canada, and that in exchange for agreeing to work as a crew member aboard the vessel, he could journey to Canada at the reduced fare of $20,000. He went to Indonesia. He boarded the Ocean Lady. He was uh, instructed by two individuals who he called Captain and First Engineer on how to operate the ship's engine and the GPS navigational system. He was then informed that he would navigate the ship to Canada. So this is different. He just signed up to be a crew member and then all of a sudden they said, no, you're in charge, you're going to navigate the ship and get there. He claims that he tried to decline and that he was threatened and kicked by the captain. He and three others took over navigation of the ship after the captain and first engineer left the ship. So the immigration division in this case found that Mr. Handasamy had paid a reduced amount for his passage to Canada. However, the federal court in Handasamy distinguished the immigration division's findings in Apula Nafar from the immigration division's findings from in Handasamy. So in Apula Nafar, the IRB explicitly found that Mr. Apula Nafar had received a material benefit in exchange for agreeing to serve as a crew member, namely, that material benefit was a reduction in the fee for his passage to Canada. Even though the immigration division in Handasami found that a reduced fare had been paid, they didn't go that tiny step further to find that the reduced fare amounted to a material benefit. So um, after this, uh, the individual, like the, the federal court sent the decision back to the IRB uh, for redetermination. So in Handa Sami, they did not uphold the, in, the inadmissibility finding, whereas in Apula Napar, they did. Uh, the final decision I'm going to talk to you about is a case called Bagri. Uh, it was a federal court decision that came out this year. Mr. Bagri was not a member of the Sun Sea or the Ocean Lady. He is a citizen of India who became a permanent resident in Canada in 2008. He was arrested in Washington State for having picked up five Indian nationals who had just crossed illegally into the U.S. from Canada. According to his U.S. Uh, arrest report, Mr. Bagri admitted to having entered the U.S. to pick up individuals. He admitted that he was expected to receive $1,000 in exchange for his services, and he had made several previous unsuccessful attempts to transport those undocumented immigrants. Based on statements that Mr. Bagri made to CBSA officers during the course of three separate interviews, he was found inadmissible pursuant to 371B for people smuggling. Uh, Mr. Bagri later contradicted certain statements he made in his prior interviews with the CBSA. For example, he later claimed that he didn't know that the smuggled people lacked the documentation required to enter the U.S. Um, so I guess he just thought that he was like a really overpaid Uber driver picking people up on the U.S. side. Uh, he also recanted from statements he had made regarding the involvement of two other particular individuals in the smuggling scheme. So this gets into what perhaps my colleague Marco will talk about later, the whole two or more, three or more person requirement in order to be an organization. So initially, when he was picked up by police, he said, yeah, there were all these other people involved, and there was my friend this guy and my friend that guy. And then later he said, no, I don't know of anyone else who was involved. It was, it was just me and another person. Uh, at the federal court, Mr. Bagri then did not dispute that he was engaged in people smuggling, nor the transnational nature of the activity. However, he disputed that he was a member of the criminal organization. He stated he knew very little about the broader smuggling scheme, and there was no evidence he intended to strengthen a criminal organization or to advance its objectives. 
the federal court held that whereas being a member of the criminal organization is an element of the 371A in admissibility, it's not an element in 371B, which contemplates engaging in activities such as people smuggling. So there's no element of having to be a member of the organization. Uh, finally, Mr. Bagri submitted that during his third interview with CBSA, he explained that though money was part of his motivation, he was also motivated to engage in people smuggling in order to help people who had family problems and were desperate. The IRB found that he was also motivated by obtaining a financial benefit. And then based on the Supreme Court decisions in B10, Mr. Bagri would have only been able to escape inadmissibility under 371B if he had been solely or merely motivated by humanitarian motives. So at the end of the day, the federal court upheld the Immigration Refugee Board's finding that Mr. Bagri was inadmissible pursuant to 371B. Uh, that's all. I mean, I hope this has given you some idea of the tension between fulfilling Canada's obligations under the Refugee Convention uh, and trying to deter individuals from participating in people smuggling, which is a very dangerous venture. Like, these are not black and white issues. They're they're exceptionally difficult. Thank you. So I'll be providing you uh, with um, <clears throat> an overview of the second ground of inadmissibility found <clears throat> excuse me, at Section 37, namely organized criminality at Section 37 1A of the Europa. My presentation will be in English. Uh, however, there is a French version of the PowerPoint which will be available on the association's website. And uh, during the discussions which follow our presentations, uh, please feel free, to, if there are any questions for me, please feel free to ask them in either French or in English. And so we'll begin by looking at the text of Section 37 1A, and you'll notice from the opening language that it is a ground of inadmissibility that applies to both permanent residents and foreign nationals. And so at the IRB, we typically see cases where the minister seeks to remove a permanent resident, and in some cases, long-term permanent residents, where the minister believes that the permanent resident is inadmissible for organized criminality. For example, being a member of a street gang. And if the permanent resident is ultimately found to be inadmissible for organized criminality, they lose their permanent resident status and are put in a position where they can be removed from Canada. But Section 37 1A also applies to foreign nationals, which means that the IRB, we also see cases where inadmissibility for organized criminality is raised against those that are seeking protection, refugee claimants. And in those cases, if the refugee claimant is ultimately found to be inadmissible for organized criminality, the effect is that their claim becomes ineligible. In other words, their refugee claim falls. So what are the essential elements in order for a permanent resident or a foreign national to be inadmissible for organized criminality? The first is the existence of an organization as described in Section 37. In other words, an organization that is engaged in a pattern of activity by a number of persons towards the commission of an indictable offense in Canada or an equivalent offense outside Canada. However, demonstrating the existence of a criminal organization is not sufficient. There also has to be evidence that the permanent resident or the foreign national is either a member of the organization or engaged in the criminal activities of the organization. Where the minister has grounds to believe that a permanent resident or a foreign national is inadmissible for organized criminality, the minister will ask the Immigration Division to hold an admissibility hearing. The Immigration Division, being one of the four divisions of the IRB, is tasked with the role of determining whether that permanent resident or foreign national is inadmissible for organized criminality. And at that hearing, it is the minister that has the burden of demonstrating that the essential elements of Section 37 1A are met. And so it is the minister that has the burden of proof. <clears throat> 
the standard of proof in the context of inadmissibility for organized criminality is reasonable grounds to believe. So if we were to put the, the uh, standards of proof on a spectrum, you have the criminal standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You have the civil law standard of uh, where the facts have to be established on a balance of probabilities. In other words, more likely than not. And then you have reasonable grounds to believe, which is less than a balance of probabilities. But in order to find someone uh, inadmissible for organized criminality, it has to be more than mere suspicion or conjecture. So having briefly touched on the burden of proof, which is on the minister, and the standard of proof, reasonable grounds to believe, let's have a look at each of the essential elements of Section 37.1a. As I mentioned, the first element that needs to be demonstrated by the minister is the existence of a criminal organization. And the IRPA does not provide a definition of what constitutes a criminal organization for the purpose of Section 37.1a. And so decision makers at the Immigration Division have looked at the case law to determine this issue. Up until B10 of the Supreme Court was decided in 2015, I would say that most members of the Immigration Division applied the reasoning in the Sitampalam case and the factors developed in the Panaratnam case to determine whether uh, a criminal organization exists for the purpose of Section 37.1a. And in Sitampalam, the Court of Appeal said that the term organization is to be given a broad and unrestricted meaning. And in Tanaratna, the court listed certain factors, such as identity, leadership, organizational structure, and occupied territory to determine whether a criminal organization exists. Then came B10, where the Supreme Court found that both people smuggling in Section 37.1b, uh, like organized criminality in section 37.1a, are both instances of organized criminality. And the Supreme Court went on to say that for the purpose of section 37.1b, it should be interpreted harmoniously with the definition of criminal, uh, of, of a criminal organization that is found in the criminal court. And since then, in decisions like Saif, the federal court has, has determined that B10 had the effect of incorporating the definition found in the criminal code, which requires, for example, at least three people to be part of the organization, into both people smuggling in Section 37.1b and organized criminality in Section 37.1a. At slide nine, you have the definition of criminal organization that is found in the criminal code. And if you compare the definition of criminal organization with the wording of section 37.1a, uh, you will see that the definition in the criminal code contains additional elements, such as the requirement that there be at least three pe people, and also that the commission of the offense results in the receipt of a material benefit. And so since B10 and the federal cases, federal court cases that followed B10, uh, it could be argued that what constitutes a criminal organization for the purpose of paragraph 37.1a is still a live issue. And uh, this uncertainty has led some members of the Immigration Division uh, to conduct an analysis under both interpretations. So in the case of Chen, for example, the ID had to determine whether a marijuana grow up operation constituted a criminal organization for the purpose of Section 37.1a. And so the Immigration Division looked at both the pre-B10 case law, which interprets 30, Section 37.1a, and the definition of criminal organization in the criminal code, uh, and found that the grow-up operation constitutes an organization under either test. And the federal court maintained the ID's decision in Chen. And so, as you can see, see from slide 11, uh, there is a broad range of organizations which have been found to be criminal organizations for the purpose of Section 37.1a. Uh, there are those highly structured organizations, like the Hells Angels, or uh, traditional organized crime groups uh, who are involved in a wide range of activities. Street gangs in Canada, which typically have less organizational structure and a narrower range of criminal activities, have also 
been found to be criminal organizations under 37-1A. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have those loosely structured organizations composed of a handful of people uh, involved in a very specific criminal activity, which, again, have been found to be organizations for the purposes of 37-1A. And finally, the organizations are not limited to those that operate in Canada. For example, street gangs operating outside Canada, such as uh, MS-13 street gang operating in El Salvador, have also been found to be criminal organizations under 37-1A. And so to summarize what we've seen so far, the minister has the burden of, prov of proving that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the essential elements of paragraph 37-1A are met, and one of those essential elements is the existence of a criminal organization. The other essential element is for the minister to demonstrate that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the permanent resident or the foreign national is either a member of the organization or that, uh, that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the person engaged in the criminal activities of the organization. And the IRPA does not contain a definition of what constitutes a member. And so, again, decision makers have looked at the case law, which says that the term should be broadly understood and there is no requirement to prove formal membership in the organization. And so if there is evidence that the person is a member of the criminal organization, the person becomes inadmissible, and there is no need for the minister to demonstrate that the person engaged in the criminal activities of the organization. Now, the language used in Section 37.1a is that a permanent resident or a foreign national is, a, is a inadmissible for being a member. And so the, the, the use of the present tense being has led to the argument that breaking links with the organization at some point in time nullifies membership. However, that's not the case. According to the case law, past membership is sufficient to find a person inadmissible for organized criminal. Where the person is not a member of the organization, the person may still be caught by the inadmissibility provision under Section 37.1a, where they engaged in activity that is part of the pattern of the organization's criminal activities. And the case of Thompson is one example. Uh, Mr. Thompson admitted that he had been a drug dealer in the Bloods street gang territory, but claimed that his activities were small time and were tolerated by the Bloods street gang. Following an admissibility hearing, the Immigration Division determined that there was insufficient evidence that Mr. Thompson was a member of the Bloods Street Gang. However, there was sufficient evidence to find that Mr. Thompson engaged in activity that was part of the pattern. The case of Ion is another example. The Immigration Division found that Mr. Ion did not meet the criteria of member. However, he was a key player in the organization in that he facilitated the commission of two attempted robberies as a driver, and his role was essential to the MO of the organization. Therefore, he was determined to be inadmissible for organized criminality, and the federal court upheld that determination. And so if the minister meets his burden of demonstrating one, that there are reasonable grounds to believe that a criminal organization exists, and two, that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the permanent resident or a foreign national is either a member or engaged in the criminal activities of the organization, the Immigration Division will issue a deportation order against the person, which, again, as I mentioned, puts the person in a position where they can be removed from Canada. Another important consequence is that the uh, person cannot appeal the deportation order to the Immigration Appeal Division, which generally hears, hears appeals from decisions of the Immigration Division. And I say it's an important consequence because the Immigration Appeal Division has, in certain cases, the discretion to grant an appeal and allow the person to remain in Canada despite the admissibility finding, inadmissibility finding if there are sufficient humanitarian and compassionate 
While there is no right of appeal to the IAD, the uh, person can still contest the Immigration Division's inadmissible fi inadmissibility finding before the federal court in the context of an application for leave and judicial review. And finally, as I mentioned at the outset of my presentation, in the case of a refugee claimant, if the refugee claimant is found to be inadmissible for organized criminality, the uh, proceedings before the RPD are terminated. The person becomes ineligible. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. So I'm going to change things up by uh, not putting a PowerPoint up there for you. Uh, feel free to close your eyes, though, and just listen. I apologize. Uh, my comments today are really going to come from my experience as a refugee lawyer at the Refugee Law Office in Toronto, a legal aid staff office serving particularly vulnerable uh, non-citizens in and around Toronto. And I'll also try to channel some of the collective wisdom of the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers. While, as we've heard, there have been some important improvements in the case law around inadmissibility in recent years, and I think of the Supreme Court decisions in FAM with respect to uh, considering immigration consequences in sentencing, Tran, which we heard about this morning, and Wong, uh, which we're hoping for something good from, and the B10 case. Uh, from my perspective, or our perspective at Carl, the inadmissibility regime continues to perpetrate some pretty significant injustices on particularly vulnerable members of the community. So I'm going to invite you to step back a little bit from the kind of detailed, uh, you know, helpful information we've just heard and look at the impact of some of these provisions on uh, members of our community. And in particular, uh, I'd like you to uh, look at with me the impact of uh, criminal inadmissibility on long-term residents of Canada. So despite uh, the obvious fact, at least to anyone caught up in the regime, that deportation uh, on criminality grounds constitutes a second punishment uh, for someone who's been convicted of a crime. The case law is, is very, very clear that I'm wrong when I say that. Uh, the case law since something like 1933 in Canada has consistently said that deportation following serving a sentence for criminality does not constitute a penal consequence. Uh, and for the lawyers here, the earliest that I found was a 1933 reference uh, regarding the royal prerogative of mercy upon deportation proceedings. Uh, but of course, famously, it's also identified in Chiarelli uh, from 1992. Nevertheless, uh, whether we can formally consider it a penal consequence or not, deportation becomes a very real and sometimes unavoidable consequence of being convicted of a crime in Canada if you are not a Canadian citizen. And that's a consequence that you face uh, in many cases, regardless of how long you've lived here. I'd like to take you through a few cases uh, just to give you a clear picture of who we're talking about when we, when we think about these cases. The first is Abdul Qadir Abdi, uh, who was a fair bit in the media a couple of months ago. He's a Somali refugee. He came to Canada when he was six years old uh, with his sister and two aunts. They were sponsored to come to Canada as refugees. Uh, a couple of years after coming here, the children were removed from the home of the two aunts uh, on allegations that they'd been neglected, and they were taken into the care of the state in Nova Scotia. Over the rest of his childhood, uh, Abdul was bounced uh, from foster home to foster home 31 times over the course of his childhood. He did not get an education beyond grade six. He was never adopted. And critically, the child protection authorities who had full legal custody over him during this period never applied for Canadian citizenship for him. So he was a permanent resident and he remained a permanent resident. Predictably, given that childhood, uh, he entered into criminal behavior. In 2014, at the age of 20, he was convicted of aggravated assault and assault of a peace officer with a weapon. He was sentenced to four and a half years. Uh, he received a couple of further assault convictions while he was in jail, 
uh, but nevertheless, following a comprehensive, fact-based, expert-driven process, the Correctional Service of Canada decided that he should nevertheless benefit from statutory release. They determined, uh, after reviewing the evidence and interviewing him, that his crimes, while they were concerning, didn't constitute serious harm, and that there were no reasonable grounds to believe that he would present a danger to the public if he served out the remainder of the sentence in the community. So the assessment team, which is composed of police officers, parole officers, and others, determined that he was eligible for release to a halfway house. However, he wasn't a Canadian citizen, he was a permanent resident. So instead of being transferred to the halfway house, he was transferred to immigration detention and remained in jail. And the Canada Border Services Agency initiated uh, deportation proceedings on grounds of serious criminality under Section 36.1. Abdul is currently before the federal court challenging the constitutionality of the decision to refer him to deportation proceedings and we'll see where that goes. Uh, his hearing is scheduled for next month. Another case, Massimo Moretto. So Massimo was born in Italy in 1969, came to Canada when, with his family when he was a baby. He was nine months old when he came. And he's lived in Canada his entire life, but for a three or four week visit to Italy when he was a kid. He became a permanent resident with his family, but he never became a Canadian citizen. He's got a crack cocaine addiction, is bipolar, and he's got a history of problems with the law here. In 2009, the Immigration Division issued a removal order against him as a result of his conviction for break and enter, and he was deemed inadmissible for serious criminality under Section 36.1A uh, of the IRPA. But because the sentence was under two years, which was the threshold at the time, he had access to the Immigration Appeal Division which has the authority to take a broader look, apply its equitable jurisdiction, and look at the fact that he's been here since he was nine months old, uh, and maybe deportation was really not the right remedy for him. They issued a three-year stay to allow him to uh, prove himself. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. He had another conviction. The IAD extended his stay for another year, uh, and then during the course of that year, he, he committed another crime which constituted serious criminality. Uh, and as a result, he was uh, deemed to have lost his stay and eligible for deportation by operation of law. Mr. Moretto uh, has no opportunity in law now because he doesn't have access to the IAD, no opportunity to present the background of his case anymore to try to remain in Canada, at least nothing in the statutory regime. He's currently before the Federal Court of Appeal challenging the constitutionality uh, of his deportation. In the Court of Appeal, uh, he lost at the Federal Court, he's now on his way to the Court of Appeal. Uh, he's arguing that his deportation pursuant to Section 36 and that automatic cancellation of his stay under Section 68.4 interfere with his rights to liberty and security of the person in a manner that's grossly disproportionate and arbitrary. His argument is specifically that the regime interferes with his liberty to make fundamental life choices. He's saying it violates his right to psychological security, and of course he has evidence about the impact on him psychologically, uh, because it fails to take into account his status as a long-term permanent resident of Canada with mental illnesses and addictions whose criminality, the reason for the deportation, is related to his disability. Mr. Moretto's case is going to be heard alongside that of David Revel, who I'm sure you've also heard about, another long-term resident of Canada who was found inadmissible for serious and organized criminality. Uh, the latter, the organized criminality, barring him from any access to equitable relief at the Immigration Appeal Division. Mr. Revel, like Mr. Moretti and Mr. Abdi, grew up in Canada from a very young age. He came here from England in 1974 when he was 10 years old. All his family and social ties are here, and he has no ties or connections in England. 
Upon removal from Canada, if that happens, he won't be able to return to Canada without permission. He can't be sponsored by a spouse because he's inadmissible. He's not eligible to seek an exemption from the requirements of the Act under Section 25 because of a bar that was placed there a couple of years ago. And the psychological evidence established that he will suffer serious harm upon removal. My, my memory is that a, a psychiatrist in a report indicated that deportation would be a life-shortening event for him. He argues, too, that his liberty interest is engaged because of the decision to stay with his family in this country, the country where he grew up, is a fundamental personal choice. He argues that his security of the person is engaged by the serious psychological harm that he would face on deportation, which goes beyond the usual uh, consequences, the usual stress and anxiety caused by deportation, which the Supreme Court in Torelli said uh, was not sufficient to engage Section 7. So while Moretto is challenging 68-4, that automatic cancellation of the stay in particular, Mr. Revel is going after the deportation regime in whole uh, as it applies to long-term residents. Uh, and the argument is that deportation of a long-term permanent resident in these circumstances for serious criminality is grossly disproportionate to any legitimate state aim. Uh, he also argues that it constitutes cruel and unusual treatment, uh, contrary to Section 12 of the Charter. Both for the lawyers among us, uh, particularly interesting is that both Moretto and Ravel are, are asking the court to reconsider Torelli, the bane of many uh, a refugee and immigration lawyer in this country. Uh, asking the court to recognize that the circumstances, both the jurisprudence and international law, have changed since 1992 when that decision was, was made. Both Moretto and Ravel, I can give people the case sites if, if you want. Both Moretto and Ravel find important support for their position in international law, and this is the last case I wanted to talk to you about briefly, in the case of Jama Warsami. Jama Warsami was born uh, on 7th of February 1984 in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, to Somali parents. Uh, however, as they had no status in Saudi Arabia, neither did he get it. Uh, he's of Somali descent, but he's never lived in Somalia. He's never visited there or resided there. He came to Canada in 1988 when he was four years old, became a permanent resident as a dependent of his mom, under the old backlog program. And then in his early 20s, he was convicted of robbery, for which he received a sentence of nine months, and then possession for the purpose, for which he received a two-year sentence. He received a removal order for serious criminality, and because he had been sentenced to two years, he, wasn't, uh, he didn't have access to the Immigration Appeal Division. So no opportunity there to, you know, assert uh, the, the equitable interests that he had in the case. No opportunity to be allowed to remain in Canada despite the inadmissibility. His pre-removal risk assessment application was denied by a minister's delegate, and he was scheduled for removal to Somalia, a place where he had never been uh, in his entire life, but was nominally his country of citizenship. Uh, my office, my, my uh, previous director, Carol DeHaan, brought an urgent complaint to the Human Rights Committee of the UN, which was ultimately successful. Uh, the complaint was under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and she argued uh, that Mr. Warsami's deportation would be contrary to the guarantees against uh, deportation to torture and to risk to life but also that it would be contrary to Mr. Wasami's family rights, family unity rights, and to his right not to be deported from his country, not to be arbitrarily deprived of the right to enter his country. In a decision uh, by the UN Human Rights Committee, uh, there is some, I think, profoundly important language about what it means to have a country, and it's something that we are hoping Canadian courts will begin to to jump into and jump onto. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm sorry to do this, but I'm going to read you one paragraph because it, it, it's moving, it's beautiful. Uh, so this is paragraph 8.4 of the Jama Warsami decision. 
where they find, with regard to the author's claim under Article 12.4 of the Covenant, the committee must first consider whether Canada is indeed the author's own country for purposes of this provision and then decide whether his deprivation of the right to enter that country would be arbitrary. On the first issue, the committee recalls its general comment number 27, where it's considered that the scope of, quote, his own country, uh, that's the, sorry, sexist language of the covenant, the scope of that provision is broader than the concept, quote, country of nationality. It's not limited to nationality in a formal sense, that is, nationality acquired by birth or conferral. It embraces, at the very least, an individual who, because of his or her special ties or claims in relation to a given country, cannot be considered to be a mere alien. In this regard, it finds that there are factors other than nationality which may establish close and enduring connections between a person and a country, connections which may be stronger than those of nationality. The words, his own country, invite consideration of such matters as long-standing residence, close personal and family ties, and intentions to remain, as well as the absence of such ties elsewhere. The committee determined, uh, despite the fact that Mr. Wasami did not have Canadian citizenship, that nevertheless Canada is his country. They conclude that his deportation would constitute an arbitrary interference with his right to enter or to re-enter after deportation his country, Canada, because deportation would dispro be disproportionate to the legitimate state aim of uh, preventing the commission of further crimes. The Human Rights Committee also found that his deportation would constitute an impermissible interference with his right to family life, contrary to Articles 17 and 23, and would put him at risk, as I've indicated, contrary to Articles 6 and 7. So I would ask you to reflect on that, and I'm hoping that the Court of Appeal will reflect on that as well. From Carl's perspective, uh, while litigation like that being brought by Mr. Zabdi Moretto and Ravel is certainly in order, uh, necessary in order to bring the Charter Protection for Non-Citizens in line with international law and modern constitutional principles. We maintain that there's also a need for policy change, and I know this is not an advocacy panel, but I'm going to advocate. There is, in our position, a fundamental difference between an individual who commits a crime shortly after arriving. Uh, and someone who has lived in Canada for many years and is part of the Canadian community and then commits a crime. This difference uh, needs to be reflected in the criminal inadmissibility regime because it currently isn't. In our view, at a bare minimum, the ministers need to amend the regulation to provide that no deportation orders should be issued against permanent residents who arrived in Canada before the age of 18 and who haven't committed a serious crime as defined in 36.1 for the first 10 years since landing. That could easily be established uh, through regulation and in fact would knock out the three cases that I started off talking about, all four in fact. For everyone else, in my view, there should be access to the IED's equitable jurisdiction for everybody prior to the execution of a removal order for serious or organized criminality. If we truly consider ourselves to be a civilized society, to use the language of Chirwa, which was repeated in, by the Supreme Court in uh, Kanthasami, it makes little sense, uh, if we do consider ourselves that way, to deny vulnerable people the opportunity to at least consider, to at least request relief from a hardship or a misfortune that might arise from strict application of the law. I recognize that opening up access to the IED for all inadmissible persons is going to be a bit of a stretch. Uh, so in the short term, what Carl has been advocating and what uh, there will likely be some litigation on uh, is that at a minimum we should go back to where we were a couple of years ago, uh, which was prior to the reduction to six months uh, in terms of access to the IED. So at a very minimum, someone who is inadmissible for serious criminality, who is sentenced to, uh, to anything less than two years, should still have access to the Immigration Appeal Division so that the broader circumstances, including the fact that they are long-term permanent residents of Canada, can be taken into account. So I hope the ministers are listening, and uh, thank you all. Okay, we have uh, 15 minutes or so for 
questions before the lunch break, and uh, I think we have a microphone. We have a microphone, or is this the one we'll be using? So thanks so much for that uh, great, uh, uh, great panel. Um, when we're thinking about uh, when we're thinking about B10 and the Supreme Court's kind of reasoning on on the humanitarian kind of exception, um, I think it's worth imagining a, a hypothetical scenario. So <laughs> imagine that it's 1939, and there's a boat with 907. Jews who are uh, fleeing persecution in Europe, and they, the boat goes to another country. They're, the passengers are denied uh, permission to disembark. Uh, the captain of the vessel tries to get permission to have the passengers disembark somewhere uh, in uh, the world. Everyone says uh, no, uh, so the, the captain brings the boat to, uh, to Canada. All of the passengers that disembark are recognized as uh, as refugees. The passengers paid for their trip uh, to uh, initially the other country and, and to Canada. So uh, the passengers are all re are all recognized as refugees. Have the uh, captain and the crew of that vessel have they engaged in in human smuggling? Are they criminally inadmissible? Are they potentially subject to life imprisonment because there's 10 or more people who have been uh, transported. And I think if you read the Supreme Court decision, I think it's pretty clear that that is human smuggling um, and that these folks would go to jail for, for life. And so the reason I think it's worth thinking about that, obviously you know where I'm going with this, the Prime Minister has just announced that he's going to apologize for the none is too many policy and specifically for Canada's uh, refusal to allow the 907 passengers on board the uh, St. Louis uh, denying permission for them to come to Canada, saying that this was a moral and legal and political failure. Uh, and yet it seems that uh, very little uh, very little has changed. So um, so when we think about the, the, the tensions uh, between kind of refugee protection on the one hand and um, I don't know, preserving the integrity of the borders or protecting vulnerable people, it seems to me that uh, uh, it seems to me that, that, that the law comes down very, very much on the side of kind of protecting the integrity of the borders, uh, rather than on the side of, of refugee uh, refugee protection. So I'm not sure I'm not sure where uh, we can go uh, with that. I don't know if that's uh, further constitutional litigation. I don't know if that's advocacy saying uh, Justin Trudeau, if you're if you if you are in fact sorry, uh, you have to not do it again. Um, so, uh, but I'm, I'm curious whether the panel has any uh, has any uh, thoughts about that. Yeah. Do you guys want to? Do you have any questions first? Thanks, Sean. And I'm just gonna um, again uh, offer a comment to all of. Um, and, and I, I want to be kind of more specific about something you said that um, I think deserves a response. Um, in advising us to appreciate the fact that many of these cases are not black and white, and I certainly am with you there, um, you suggested that um, the individual's lack of credibility in relation to whether or not they had been fighters was a point of note in how we think through of the uh, criminal and disability uh, context. And I just want to put out very concretely that from my perspective as a scholar and an academic working in this area, that it's very important to look at the context, right? And for me, the important context of that case is that Sri Lanka at the time was a country with recordly, record high levels of human rights violations, specifically against current and former members of the Tigers. And that even if somebody was um, associated with the Tigers, the reality is that Canada would not have deported that individual.
individual at that time because of the risk they would face if returned to Sri Lanka at that time. And I think that's very important context as we think through um, these cases through a human rights lens. And so I would just offer that part of the puzzle always needs to be what the human rights context is. And so for me, that piece was um, missing in the way that you presented the facts. So I just wanted to offer that. Um, and while I have the mic, I'm going to abuse my privilege and just offer one more comment um, uh, for Andrew, um, very, uh, who very helpfully um, uh, shared with us some of the frustrations from an advocate's perspective of dealing with the limitations in Canada's um, uh, uh, deportation regime. And let me just suggest, as you sort of uh, reminded us to think about how international law can help us with this problem, that it was way back in 1955 when the International Court of Justice had to puzzle through, you know, what Guatemala's responsibilities were, first in relation to somebody who had lived in that country for decades but never actually had the piece of paper that said they were a Guatemalan national. And what the court came up with in that case was a list of indicia, exactly as you suggested, of belongingness, right? And that that's indeed how we should think about citizenship. And I would just urge the advocates in the room to think big when it comes to challenging Canada's citizenship regime, because this is an issue that goes beyond deportation, it goes beyond criminal admissibility, and it really speaks to the fact that right now in this country, the only meaning that citizenship has is a statutory one. And I think that's deeply problematic. And it affects the kind of people you've talked about, Andrew, in your presentation, but it also affects a whole range of other people, including people who never had papers to begin with, right? And I think we seriously need to engage with the deficits in Canada's citizenship regime and change it. Um, and so I'd be interested in your comments there. So hopefully I didn't abuse the privilege of having the mic to you all. Thank you. Uh, so going to the first comment, I would suggest that we have come a long since the St. Louis. Um, one of the big differences being that in 1939, those 900 people were not even allowed to disembark before they were turned away. Here, Canada escorted those vessels in. Um, the individuals, so only a small minority of the individuals were either prosecuted criminally or found inadmissible for their part in organizing the people smuggling. So of the 500 people total from the Ocean Lady and the Sun Sea, very small percentage were found inadmissible or were alleged to be inadmissible for organized criminality. The difference now is that even if those inadmissible people, um, even if the, the people who would eventually be found inadmissible for 37 will not have access to uh, the refugee determination process, they will still get access to a pre-removal risk assessment, which will assess whether they face danger upon removal. It's by no means an automatic sending them back. They are still going to get a risk assessment done. Other difference being, um, I don't know what evidence there was in the St. Louis case, but here with the Ocean Lady cases, uh, the Sun Sea cases, these individuals were paying about $40,000 on average to be smuggled in really poor conditions. This was a profit venture. This was not a solely a humanitarian venture to bring people to Canada. Uh, in one of the cases, it described how the individual who uh, found himself having to navigate the boat was instructed uh, that if he was found outside of Canadian international or outside of Canadian waters, he was to sink the boat and throw the cell phone overboard. These individuals were not the individuals who were uh, organizing the criminal smuggling ring. Did not have the best interests of the passengers aboard. It really was a, a profit uh, endeavor. Um, 
so yes, uh, I regret if you feel the humanitarian piece was missing. I really did focus on, um, I was trying to focus on the tension between the two, uh, how it's, it was difficult for the government to process these individuals at the time. They did their very best. Um, there's evidentiary problems. It, uh, it really was uh, a bit chaotic when all of these individuals um, found themselves at the, uh, at the Canadian border at the time. Um, still proud to be a Canadian citizen. So thanks. Thanks for that. Just uh, going back to the arrival of those boats, I do want to remind us of the reality of what happened when those boats actually showed up in Vancouver. You'll remember there was an election campaign happening at that time, and we had the leadership candidates uh, posing in front of the ships, uh, saying that our borders are being overrun by terrorists. Everybody on the Ocean Lady was immediately detained. All were alleged to be uh, security risks initially. Uh, we had legislation come down very, very quickly, proposing that people who arrived in this way, it was C2, C4, uh, that people who arrived this way should be arbitrarily detained, held in detention without access to a detention review for, I think, the first year, uh, and multiple other changes. So, you know, it's, it wasn't, certainly they were allowed off the boat, but let's be clear, they were allowed off the boat and put in jail. Uh, the situation is better, but it's not that much better. In terms of uh, this question of the profit motive, I, I hear you, of course. Uh, there are people taking advantage of very, very desperate people around the world. Uh, but when we look at people smuggling or the ways in which people need to enter Canada uh, without prior admission, we need to keep into, in mind the fact that there are no legal ways for the vast majority of people at risk to enter Canada. So they are forced by government policies, by interdiction, by visa, by carrier sanctions to find whatever way they can get here. And that does require that they find money from family friends frequently and that they get on these leaky ships. So uh, again, I think context is really, really critical. Uh, Sherry, your comment about uh, the, what, what citizenship actually means, I think that's, that's beautiful. I don't know what to say about it, except that, yes, we need to develop some momentum on that issue. 